Yep. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We were in closed session, so we're a couple of minutes late. Sorry about that. Um, I'd like to call to order the City Council's slash successor agency to the Redevelopment Agency meeting of City of San Carlos, September 9th, 2013. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Changes to the order of agenda. Um, Mr. Malpe, I was thinking that we would change, if it's possible, a swap 5A and 5B. In other words, 5B would come first and then 5A. Is that all right? Yes, any, sir. Any problem with that, Council? Okay, thank you. Any other changes? All right, uh, report from closed session, Mr. Rubens. Uh, there are no reportable items, but we did not complete the agenda, so we'll be reconvening at the conclusion of this meeting. All right, thank you. Uh, council communications and announcements. Council communications and announcements are brief items from members of the City Council regarding upcoming events in the community and correspondence that they have received. They are informational in nature and no action will be taken on these items at this meeting. Mr. Grocott, anything? Uh, just one item. I had gotten uh, an email from one of the residents who thought it might be nice to recognize any of our firefighters that went up and uh, help fight the rim fire and so I thought I'd mention that to you it's okay. something we might want to do maybe we can get the uh, city staff to look in to see how many I think there's at least half a dozen I think that went up there so maybe we can have some sort of a maybe those individuals could come to City Council or something and we could if possible if, if although those schedules might be hard to put together but at least get their names and uh, have some sort of a an honor for them okay I'll leave that to staff anything else mm -mm. Ms. Clapper <laughs> This morning I attended the uh, JPA board meeting for the San Mateo County Library and um, did the final approval of the budget for fiscal year 13-14. And we will be um, getting a report from uh, the library manager in an upcoming meeting with the um, annual report that is currently in draft form that they're producing with some, some really great statistics about the, uh, what our libraries do in the county. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Collins. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, just a couple things. I attended the uh, HIA lunch uh, last week. We had a very interesting pr presentation on what uh, the process that Belmont is going through to uh, uh, revamp or remodel Ralston Avenue, which is a very uh, it's been a very uh, public process, and uh, that was quite interesting. Um, and then the other thing I attended our government affairs along with, I believe. Uh, three other council members last Friday. We had a great presentation by our own Christine Boland on our Parks and Rec Commission. Okay, thank you. Vice Mayor Albert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I just had one item, which is uh, after our discussion last time at the last meeting of the uh, uh, below market rate housing waiver request, it occurred to me, um, I think there's, a, there's an avenue of uh, trying to resolve some of the log jams with the Transit Village that we haven't taken advantage of yet, which would be to uh, um, have the council send a letter to the oversight boards of Samtrans and, and Caltrain um, and basically ask for their assistance in trying to resolve some of the, uh, the uh, quandaries that we're operating under. Um, and so I don't know if anybody else is interested in that, but, but I'd be interested in having us uh, discuss the possibility of doing something like that in short order, see if we can make something happen. Okay. I think that might be a good idea. Maybe we can schedule that, agendize that, and have a discussion about that at the next meeting. If that's the desire of the council, that's what we'll do. All right. That? Okay. Good. All right. Uh, and I had uh, um, yesterday. I attended the San Mateo County. It was the 12th annual Interfaith Public Safety Memorial Service, and it's it's quite a moving uh, service. It was held up at uh, Notre Dame Dean Muir University, and it honors all the fallen firefighters and police officers, all the public safety folks uh, that we've lost in the past year. And the good news was that during the year we didn't lose anyone who was on duty. Uh, there were some people who had been retired who we did lose, and they were honored. But uh, this year we did not lose any any folks. But um, every year they honor all the all the people that have been lost over the years, uh, and all the agencies in San Mateo County. And it's a uh, it's a quite a moving service with uh, bagpipes and music and readings, and uh, every name is mentioned, and with a bell uh, rung after it. So that's all I have. Um, Okay, moving on. Five, and let's go to 5B, which is 
present the proclamation present the proclamation of the friends of the library for their donation to the library remodel project of two hundred and seventy five thousand dollars which is amazing to me Jan Smith, president of uh, Friends of the Library, and representing the Friends of the Library with me is Nancy Laxon Heighton, secretary, and also Karen Clapper, who was our renovation coordinator. Three weeks ago, the Friends of the Library board was very fortunate, and we got to tour the library renovation, and we were extremely, extremely pleased. On behalf of the Friends of the Library, officers, board, our wonderful volunteers and members, it is our privilege to present to the City of San Carlos our total donation of $275,000 for this excellent renovation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you so much. I, uh, I'm stunned. I mean, it's amazing the amount of money. Now, this is over, what, an eight-year period you raised this money, or ten-year period? Yes. Right, and that's amazing. It, just selling basically books, uh, once, is it once a month? Membership. Donations, memberships, and selling books. Uh, let me just read a couple of comments here. Recognizing and commending the Friends of the San Carlos Library for their contribution to the community. Whereas the Friends of the Library was established in 1999 after the opening of the new library, and they've worked tirelessly to organize and stock the bookshop, coordinate selling of rare autograph books through the internet, and staff the monthly friend shop to sell other used books and souvenirs. And the proceeds raised by the Friends of the Library have always been donated to worthy library causes such as Healthy Cities Tutoring, Author Talks, Children's Programming, and other library programs. Whereas the Friends of the San Carlos Library have been involved in the planning of the remodel from the beginning, library remodel from the beginning, and have generously pledged $275,000 to the remodel efforts. Uh, therefore, I proclaim that I, Bob Grisilli, Mayor of the City of San Carlos, on behalf of the entire City Council and San Carlos community, hereby commend and thank the Friends of the San Carlos Library for its generosity and contribution to the San Carlos Library Interior Renovation Project dated this ninth day of September 2013. Thank you so much, ladies, and everybody. So, want to get some more pictures here? Cool. Great. Again, thank you. Yeah. Sorry? Oh, sure, absolutely. Go ahead. Maybe we'll step over this way a little bit. Thanks. Thanks for holding me, by the way. Anyway, all sides, both sides, all sides. Thank you again, ladies, so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. So now we'll jump back to 5A, which is um, a mosquito abatement district update and a verbal report by Robert Gay and Betsy Snyder. Mr. Gay here. <coughs> Betsy, do you want to say something first? Um, good evening. I don't have um, a presentation plan, but uh, Manager Gay does. Just say that um, the district has an excellent um, financial administrator in place. And it seems to me that the internal controls are being abided by by the district. But um, Manager Gay has a report. Thank you, Betsy. Mr. Gay, welcome. Thank you very much. Mayor Grisilli, Vice Mayor Olbert, City Council, uh, City staff, and residents of San Carlos, uh, your Mosquito and Vet Control District uh, wants to thank you for this opportunity to address your city and provide an update on our services and programs. Uh, West Nile virus is alive and well, 
in the state of California and the Bay Area also. As of September 3rd, uh, a total of 101 human cases of West Nile virus uh, have, were, have been reported from 23 counties with six fatalities. In the Bay Area, Santa Clara County and Contra Costa County have recorded the highest West Nile virus activity in humans with three cases. They've had over 100 positive dead birds, 36 positive mosquito pools, and four to six sentinel chickens have turned positive. In San Mateo County, we have recorded a number of chronic West Nile virus positive birds and squirrels, most recently a squirrel in Burlingame and a house finch in El Granada. But chronic West Nile virus infections have a very low level of virus and have an unknown infection date. Otherwise, we have no human cases in San Mateo, no positive dead birds, no positive mosquitoes, and no positive sentinel chickens. Uh, so we are very proud of our program so far this West Nile virus season. Uh, our staff continues to provide uh, your residents of San Carlos uh, mosquito control throughout their communities. Uh, they can call the district and within 24 hours, a staff member will be at their residence controlling and looking at what their problem is from mosquitoes. We do surveillance for all of the vector-borne diseases in this county. That includes West Nile virus, two, not, two forms of Lyme disease now, uh, hantavirus and plague, and a new tick-borne disease we uncovered, tularemia and anaplasmosis. Uh, we do door-to-door -door inspections for mosquito problems. That's especially going on right now down in Menlo Park with the new Aedes aegypti I'll cover in a minute. Again, as stated, we do our service requests within 24 hours. We do control of ground nesting yellow jackets within your community. A great many people will call the district for yellow jacket problems and we will go out and control the ones that are ground nesting. We provide mosquito fish to all of your backyard ponds that people have. We do presentations to school and civic groups and we of course do any kind of identification for ticks and insects. Many people will bring us their doors off their kitchen cabinets wanting to know what insect is burrowing into it. We do public outreach and we now do all of the rodent surveillance program. Our staffing has significantly changed over the last two years. We hired a new finance director and accountant after a national search. Uh, we received them from the corporate world. We hired a new assistant manager and laboratory director with a national search. We also hired two new vector control technicians with a statewide search. These new staff members have allowed the district to maintain its successful operational and entomological programs while at the same time increasing modernization and accountability. Many new programs have evolved and even more are on the design table. A new program the district has developed is the capability of performing DNA testing in our laboratory with a real-time PCR. This allows us to go out into your community, capture mosquitoes that could be positive, bring them back to the lab, identify them that morning, test them that afternoon, and if they're positive for West Nile virus, we can go out and control them that night. We can do everything within 24 hours. Right now it takes 10 days to receive the information back from the state. In addition, six months ago, we established a new mosquito surveillance program using a special ovipositional trap, trying to capture the eggs that are laid by female mosquitoes. This summer, both in Fresno and Madera County, a very serious vector of disease uh, around the world called Aedes aegypti mosquito was uncovered. We also, with one of our ovitraps, uncovered the same mosquito in the Holy Cross Cemetery in Menlo Park. Because of that, uh, we put out a press release with the County of San Mateo Public Health Officer, Scott Morrow, and we have been doing a day, a door-to-door -door inspection surrounding that cemetery. We've uncovered seven other homes that are positive for this mosquito, 
and we are now instituting control measures that will be going on this week. We are also performing a major review and retooling of our rodent, wildlife, and tick surveillance programs for Lyme disease. With all these program reviews, we also have experienced an exhaustive series of financial and administrative reviews and audits over the last two and a half years. As a result of these audits and reviews, the district has implemented all of the financial and administrative recommendations that have been offered. Those include adopting new financial policies, adopting new administrative policies, performing criminal background checks on all new staff members, performing credit checks on all financial staff, performing drug testing on all new staff, contracting with a new auditor, contracting with a human resource company, adopting new extremely restrictive policies on district credit card usage, contracted for an internal control audit, developed an internal control procedure manual, and expanded the district monthly report that goes to each appointing authority. And I'm sure Trustee Snyder is getting those district reports to you on a monthly basis. The district continues to stress the most effective form of governance for a mosquito and vector control district is a sole function, independent special district. Your mosquito and vector control district is countywide. The county environmental health also transferred their remaining rodent sewer baiting programs to the district in 2008. Thus, all mosquito and vector control programs are handled by your district. And it was also noted in all previous LAFCO reviews that your district is effectively providing mosquito and vector control services to best meet the public health and safety needs of the county residents. The district also fully supports the current form of governance with a board of trustees where each city and the county appoint a member to the board as outlined in the Health and Safety Code. These trustees give the district direct access to the cities where information can be transferred each month by a number of the communication tools that are selected by each appointing authority. The trustees also bring an outstanding array of experience and skills to the governing board. The county trustee is a certified public accountant and is the finance director at the ACT Theater in San Francisco. He is on our finance committee. Foster City, Rick Wyckoff, trustee, is a prior city manager and city council member, also on our finance committee and policy committee. Pacifica trustee is a prior city mayor. East Palo Alto trustee is a prior council member. Hillsboro trustee is the chief of infectious disease at Kaiser Permanente. Brisbane trustee has an MBA in accounting and finance and a doctorate in medical sociology, also on our finance and policy committee. And the San Mateo trustee is in code enforcement. Other trustees are in healthcare, own local businesses, research scientists and educators. The district is also looking at bringing Brent Ives from BHI Management Consulting to the district to further educate the trustees on governance, communications, and supervisory management. In our opinion, the diversity of trustees appointed by the cities and the county provide the best form of governance for a mosquito and vector control district. And now coupled with all the new internal controls that were instituted, our auditors consider our program to be outstanding. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Gay. Uh, could we ask you some questions? Absolutely. Does anyone have any questions? Mr. Grocott? I just have a few. Um, you had mentioned, could, could you just highlight any uh, work you do with other counties? You mentioned Menlo Park and the mosquitoes. I imagine, you know, the mosquitoes don't recognize county lines and Menlo Park is close to Santa Clara, could you talk about that? 
we work very closely with Santa Clara County um, because we're on their border. And right now they're having a very significant West Nile virus outbreak in Santa Clara County. Um, they've had nine major fogging operations going on. Uh, they don't have the equipment to do all of that, so they borrow ours. So we provide them our equipment to do their fogging with. Um, we do a great many programs together on the salt ponds, the, rec uh, the reclamations that are going on out here in the bay. Uh, we've been working together on those. Uh, we have another program called Controlling Cord Grass, which is going on around the bay. And much of that is also done down in Santa Clara County. All the coastal region districts all get together on a monthly basis, and we look at how we can support each other in our operations. Uh, with the advent and finding of 80s Egypti in Menlo Park, we were very concerned that our staffing was not going to be adequate. Uh, so we contacted Santa Clara County and asked if they would have individuals that could support us if needed. Uh, we haven't needed them at this point. Uh, we did receive an individual from public health who's been helping us on a daily basis, and the state is providing information and support to us. So we actually have a very good cooperative program with Santa Clara. The, the other two things, I rather than put them as questions, I'll just put them as comments. It, to this council member, it would appear that your title of Mosquito Abatement District is a bit dated considering all the things that you went through that you do and how you picked up things from the county. And I, I would just think at some point you'd want to change that just as a matter of properly communicating with the voters and, and so forth what exactly your district does. Uh, when I read the report, you know, when, we, when this whole thing came up with the grand jury and so forth, and, and I read that and it talked about as you have noted about all vector-borne diseases, it opened my eyes to that to the fact that you're doing more than just you know uh, trying to mitigate problems with mosquitoes. And then, lastly, my my last comment is I was a bit surprised when um, I had a situation in my neighborhood where every time I took my dog for a walk, I'd bring her home and find like 20 fleas all over her, and I figured out where they were coming from because I watched her one time and I. And, and you know she was doing her her business, and I just watched all these fleas just light upon her. And I actually called the city manager to find out if you guys did anything about that. And I was surprised to find out the answer was no. So that's that can be a problem at different seasons, uh, right here in our community, and I'm sure in others. Uh, the name of the district is San Mateo County Mosquito and Vector Control District. We changed the name when the programs from the county were transferred us in 2008. And we can look into controlling those fleas for you. Other questions? Karen? Uh, Ms. Clapper? Uh, yes. I've um, been looking at these reports that they, as they get dropped off in my mailbox each time. And this same question has come up in, in my mind several times. I'm, I'm trying to um, get a feeling for this has to do with the um, the consolidated fund statement, the balance sheet, and also the um, I'm looking at the latest one that was issued here on this um, on the iPad, um, and also the uh, district profit and loss. And and so it shows like um, total in checking and savings of six point four million dollars. And on a regular basis, at least for the last year, the um, there's an income of almost 1.2 million dollars in excess, or yeah, in excess of the of the costs, and I'm wondering if there's something about what the district does that requires the setting aside of reserves to for replacing vehicles or rebuilding buildings, that there are such large cash balances that that are required in your operation. So I was curious if you could talk a little bit more about that financial aspect. Maybe not now, but at some point in the future we could get more information. You can do it right now if you like. Is, but. Please do, because I have the same question. Um, we had a, we're doing a seismic retrofitting of our parking garage, and so we budgeted for that uh, this last fiscal year, and we were not able to get the permit with the city of Burlingame in time to start the construction. Uh, to get the project done in last fiscal year. It has been done this fiscal year right now. 
Um, and we also are in the middle of a programmatic environmental impact report uh, with, uh, it's a cooperative program between nine counties and that program report, we budgeted more for that project than we needed and it's been carrying over now into this fiscal year. So it's going to go probably until December. Uh, we also had two directors of the district leave the district and we brought on uh, new individuals at a much lower rate and we didn't bring them on for a period of three to four months. We had acting people in those positions which saved the district money. Um, and that was probably, and we had two vehicles that we scheduled to purchase and we didn't purchase them. So there were a number of reasons of why that was the way it was. We also budgeted 250000 for pesticides and we didn't have to use that amount because the dikes out on Bear Island were broken, as you well know, and now those, the tidal is coming in and out and we're not having to treat out there on Bear Island as much. So our pesticide account were probably down to about 160000 that we're only spending last fiscal year. Um, so there were a number of reasons of why that was. Other questions, Mr. Collins? Uh, none at this time. Robert? Yeah, actually, um, my question was for Ms. Ms. Schneider. Is, is that okay to ask her? Why don't we finish with Mr. Gay first? And okay. I, I'm sorry. Just to buttress it or to ask a little bit more. So what is your normal reserve then, Mr. Gay? What would, what would you expect in a normal time to have in reserve in cash? About $4.9 So in effect, you basically have one year reserve all the time. That's what you'd like to have, one year reserve? Because that's apparently what your budget is. At least yes, the health and year. safety code called allowed uh, districts to carry 60% of their budget over. And when they redid the health and safety code with Senate Bill 1588, they changed that. And most districts now carry a year to a year and a half of uh, revenue. Um, the West Nile virus, I think, is what prompted everybody to have a special reserve account for uh, emerging diseases that occur mm -hmm. and the state allows us to carry 30 percent of our operating budget as a special reserve account the district will be finance committee will be looking into that this year uh, because of our revenues that we currently have the benefit assessment was not raised at all for the last it's been three years now there's been no raising of the assessment and the special tax that your city pays of three dollars and seventy four cents uh, hasn't changed either okay I would hope not considering you have six million dollars or had six million dollars in the Absolutely. bank so <laughs> just just curious again we only look at it we're looking at a small snapshot not the details the Finance Committee has Ms. Clapper asked the question how much of the just for curiosity what did, how much did the uh, parking garage cost or the parking thing cost uh, the seismic retrofitting of the parking garage is going to cost about two hundred and twenty thousand okay but anyway, as you said, you, you're required to keep a year, and most keep more for other things. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry. Now, Mr. Olbert has a question. Actually, that discussion prompted a question. Um, you want to talk to Trustee Schneider? No, actually, uh, it's for you, sir. Okay. The the uh, um, one one of the one of the risks for any organization when uh, uh, surpluses start building up or reserves start building up is uh, not necessarily that money gets squandered, but, but that uh, tasks get taken on that aren't necessarily mission critical. Um, and uh, I'm going to use this as an example. I don't mean to pick on Mr. Brokott's uh, fl dog with, with fleas, but let's say hypothetically um, Lucy, Lucy, uh, Lucy's fleas, but let's say hypothetically that wasn't really a major public health issue, but you had the money around so you would do it. What are your processes and decision making and prioritization making processes for making sure you don't stray into that kind of area? And, and that, you know, if there really is truly a sufficient surplus, maybe you move for lower assessments from the member, eight, member communities or what have you. To answer that in two phases, the first phase is the district has a strategic plan, an eight-year plan, and your trustee Schneider is on that committee. Uh, and that plan helps give us uh, ideas on directions of where we want the district to go and the areas that are needed, depending on what's needed in the community. Um, our big concern that we're having right now, of course, is 80s Egypti. That's in Menlo Park. But we also have big concerns with ticks and Lyme disease on the coast. Uh, as you well know, CDC has estimated that the percentage of people positive with Lyme disease is, is a third what its actual rates are. Um, so for us, 
you know, we try and make sure that we look at and analyze what diseases are present in the community and what is the risk of getting, of having your residents getting those diseases. Some of the diseases are, are just enzootic diseases that are out there like bubonic plague you have on San Bruno Mountain. We monitor that two or three times a year just to make sure it doesn't get anywhere past the deer mice population. Uh, if it does, then we have to enact a major control program. Uh, same with hantavirus. You have hantavirus that's on the watershed. You have hantavirus that's located on San Bruno Mountain. And you have hantavirus that's located on the coast. We also uncovered a squirrel in the city of Atherton was positive with plague. Um, when these things come up, then we just have to do an assessment on how, what, what is the risk of this in getting into our community. Um, I think that's probably the most important part of our strategic plan. But you're in a very unique area here on the peninsula because you have San Francisco Airport. <coughs> that's very close. You have uh, the ports. And you have a huge population here that travel throughout the world. And it's very easy for them to bring back endemic diseases when they travel to Southeast Asia, Africa, Central America. And right now, there's a major dengue outbreak going on in Southeast Asia. So it would be really easy for somebody to go there, get infested, bring it back. And if they were to come in contact with Aedes aegypti in Menlo Park, we have one person positive right now in Foster City with dengue fever. And they've traveled to Redwood City to get treated at Kaiser. Well, that's not close enough to get in contact with the flight range of those mosquitoes in Menlo Park. But if it was, and they did contact, it would be really easy for that mosquito to become positive for dengue fever and then transmit it to all the kids and, and uh, residents that live right around the location where that mosquito is found. OK. Okay, do you have a question for Ms. Snyder? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you, Mr. Gay, very much thank you. for coming. <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Schneider. Um, my question actually, uh, when I was reviewing the materials, one of the things that's always struck me as challenging for the oversight of the mosquito abatement and vector abatement district is uh, the sheer size of the oversight board, mm -hmm. a large number of people. And so I just wanted to uh, uh, make sure that there's there's nothing that you feel we ought to be uh, lobbying for um, uh, organizationally just to make sure that things are being as efficient and as effective as they can can be. Um, I think it is difficult having a board that is at large. It's true. Because board members are afraid to speak up. However, the complexion of the board is changing. Um, two of the board members have their terms have not been renewed from their appointed uh, entities. And we have some new people coming on, on, I mean, who have been come on, who have come on, <laughs> um, as um, Bob explained to you, who um, are better qualified. Although it's still difficult. Um, the the uh, communication is difficult in meetings. Um, but we do our best. <laughs> I, I'm, that I'm quite sure, and I know that, again, you certainly have as, as an individual, and thank you again for, for your role in, in this whole situation. Um, let me just mention that uh, when uh, uh, you're in the process of looking at strategic plans and whatnot, there are uh, model governance models that, that can perhaps address some of the issues of having such a large oversight mm -hmm. board. Uh, executive executive group, executive boards and whatnot. I'm not trying to recommend one or the other, but just uh, I would encourage you and your colleagues to have a, a full and frank discussion about what you think would work best for doing the oversight role and and, and uh, see whether there's some changes you might want to make. That's a good idea. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Gay. Appreciate it. Okay. The next item <clears throat> we have on the agenda is public comment. Uh, people wishing to uh, address City Council on matters not on the posted agenda. We'd like to keep this to a couple of three minutes for each speaker. I have three speaker cards. First one is Naweed Amin, I believe. Sorry? No, Mr. Amin, you're first. You're up. Would you like to speak? You have three minutes. Uh, you, later on, you can. We'll take you and then just fill out a card later. Not a problem. Okay. Well, council members, city staff, members of the public, uh, to my understanding, the city staff has provided you with a copy of the document. 
with uh, three ideas uh, that I proposed to the city of San Carlos. And uh, so today I want to talk about four things. I understand I have a very limited period of time, so I'll, I'll be brief and concise to the point. The first idea is, uh, and I've given an example, for example, the city of San Mateo has listed their city council commission and committee members all on a single piece of paper along with uh, what times they meet and uh, basic information. So I would suggest uh, that the city of San Carlos uh, adopt something like that where it's a one page or two page PDF file and that could also be incorporated uh, into any, anyone, anytime a, there's a new council member or there's a new committee member, new commission member, new board member, or, or if just the public is interested. And I would highly advise that. Now the second item is the idea of a mascot. Now to the best of my understanding, the city of San Carlos does not have a mascot or a person that's city approved that could be in costume. That would, the idea would be at venues, city approved venues, uh, festivals, anywhere where there's a city presence or you want there to be a community presence, uh, this person in a costume or a mascot could advocate and could will naturally generate publicity and curiosity from onlookers. And so they could ask questions about the city of San Carlos. And so the person in the costume or mascot could answer those questions, you know, directing them to the various city departments, answering basic questions, things like that. Now the third item, uh, the third idea that I propose is the idea of having a city of San Carlos web stores. Various cities, towns across the country have such a device, an instrument. The instrument would, would I'm sorry, the instrument would essentially be a web store that does not require physical presence. The cost is very minimal comparing to having, you know, a, a physical presence such as a brick and mortar store. So the idea would be you, you would sell city approved merchandise that can be apparel, maybe coffee mugs, uh, something easy to uh, put the logo on, things like that, as well as the, the city web store would also allow uh, the public to donate. For example, if I want, if I like trees and I like the San Carlos parks, I could donate to the Parks and Recreation Department. If I want, if I like the police department and the sheriff's office uh, doing an excellent job, I could donate to the sheriff's office. Now this would be through an option, through a button uh, highlighting various options through this City of San Carlos web store. And so I'd ask you to add these three items as discussion items. I'm not asking for an action. And I do understand that it's certainly within your authority. Sometime during the meeting, hopefully one, any council member makes a motion to add these three items at a later, uh, at a later council meeting. Hopefully someone seconds that. Now the last but not least, um, Although I'm not here in this capacity, I just want to thank you guys for supporting the Sheriff's Office. In fact, uh, I'm pictured on one of the flyers here. I am a current Sheriff's Office volunteer, and uh, the flyers are obviously right outside the, uh, the countertop that's outside the council chambers. And, and uh, again, uh, although I'm not here in this professional capacity, I'd encourage you to continue to support your Sheriff's Office. Uh, they certainly like to hear from you you know, provide feedback, provide constructive advice, and so forth. And I'll, again, I, I want to congratulate you for your support towards them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Amin. The next uh, speaker card I have is Mary Montalbano. Hello, Councilman. I'm Mary Montalbano, and I would like to reintroduce. Ms. Montalbano, Ms. I apologize. Could you move just a little bit that Over direction? Here? Perfect. Because we're this trying good? to perfect. We're trying okay. to record it. Thank you so much. All right. I would like to reintroduce and propose the idea that I read in the local paper just recently regarding the San Carlos apparel with the logo saying "The City of Good Living." <clears throat> I, for one, and many of my friends think this was a great idea, and and a pride to wear. We have many functions, such as wine festivals, jazz festivals, craft fairs, and parents of school and San Carlos sports teams that would love to wear something showing our town pride. Let's look into this again and revisit this proposal. This does not have to be a cost to San Carlos, uh, but a choice for individuals to purchase their own as well as staff members if made available. The city 
has a booth at every city function and orders can be taken or online website can be established to order such apparel. And I notice that you have, Mr. Caselli, one that says the City of Good Living. We do, and it's available right now at is it Chamber of Commerce. With the Chamber of Commerce. Chamber and of is Commerce it for Center. sale? It certainly is, ma'am. It is? Yep. And uh, it, it's, where, where do you have it advertised at? Uh, Chamber of Commerce does the advertising. You do. It should and be on the website, too, I would assume, but I don't know. I don't you can buy a hat, too. You can buy a hat, too. No. Just the hats? Through the Chamber of Commerce. Okay. Well, I'd like to see it reintroduced as far as a proposal to, to generate some something for San Carlos, because I, for one, would like to wear something, as I'm very proud to live in the city of good living. Thank you okay. very much for Thank your comments. You. The next speaker card I have is Andre Carpio. Mr. Carpio? <clears throat> Appreciate it, Mr. Carpio. If you could keep your comments to about three minutes, please. <clears throat> My name is Andre Carpio. I come from Emeryville, and I have been coming since two or three about the theft of my solar car. The reason <clears throat> I came tonight is because I learned recently <clears throat> it's a hearsay and speculation that at the time of the theft of my solar car, the capital city council instructed the police to let the thief get away with my car. And, <clears throat> of course, <clears throat> it's a position that is difficult to understand, but since I haven't been able to recover my solar car, and since the police, <clears throat> and since the city council hasn't done anything to recover my solar car, <clears throat> then I'm inclined to believe that the story that I heard, that I was told, is true. And uh, <clears throat> I would ask uh, Mr. Godko, he, how come he does not know? Maybe he's part of it. That's probably why the letter from, uh, from uh, <clears throat> Chief Rathaus <clears throat> came about and explaining a version that is, that is not true. And I'm contesting that. And this is very difficult. And I think this is uh, very critical for uh, <clears throat> Mr. Groco. He, since he's seeking re-election here, we have uh, a high level of fraudulent concealment. It's a civil conspiracy to steal my solar car. It's a historical item. And I'm the inventor and the, the manufacturer. I'm the owner, and next month I'm going to pay for the insurance for a thief to have my car back east someplace. And this is something you should do, or this should be part of the campaign um, literature. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Carpio. <coughs> Did you want to speak, ma'am? Please come up to the microphone. And then later on, if you'd fill out a card and hand it to the city clerk, that would be terrific. Thank you. I, too, read the article about the uniforms for the staff and employees. And if um, they want to purchase something, that's fine. But to use city funds for that, I think, is a total waste of money. And I don't see where we would spend between almost $10,000 and $27,000 for optional uniforms for, our, for the staff. If we have money in the reserves, I think the better way to use that money would be get the scoot back. The scoot takes care of getting rid of all that extra traffic around the schools. It takes care of getting rid of a lot of pollution. And for those that take, took the scoot when we had it before into the city, it frees up a lot of parking places. So um, I'd say we nix the uniforms if we have to pay for them. If people want to buy them, that's a different story and get the scoot back. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else, <clears throat> excuse me, wishing to speak on public comment or an items not on the posted agenda? Sure, ma'am, come on up. That's fine. That's fine. It's good to have friends. Uh, back to the uniforms again. With so many programs being uh, cut, the school, the fire, the police, the park, the senior citizen, the money that was allotted for the uniforms should not 
go to uniforms. It should pick up where everything, the programs that have been cut. If they want a uniform, have these people, no jeans, no tank tops, no sneakers, no shorts. You have a uniform. They'll come properly dressed and you'll have a uniform. But to pay that kind of money when other services are being cut drastically, it's crazy. I don't even know who thought of that idea, but I hope he had a terrible night's sleep. Thank you for your comments. Just to be clear, no money was ever allocated for this. This was just a discussion item, so just to be clear. All right, anyone else wishing to speak uh, on public comment? All right, seeing none, we'll move on. Item seven is the consent calendar. Consent calendar items are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. No separate discussion on these items unless members of the council, staff, or public request specific items be removed for separate action. Is there anyone on the council who wishes uh, to remove any of the items? Mr. Mayor? Yes. I wanted to remove item C and F. C and F. Anything else? Hearing none, I'd uh, entertain a motion for the other items. Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll uh, recommend that we uh, approve item 7A, B, D, E, G, and H. Are there? That's it. Is that it? Is there a second? Second. All right. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion on those items? Hearing none, roll call, please. <laughs> item C and item F are removed from the from the the uh, <clears throat> excuse me from the motion everything else is in the motion councilmember clapper yes councilmember collins yes councilmember grocott yes councilmember obert yes mayor Grisselli. yes all right as is our uh, usual situation we'll put those to the end of the meeting moving on item eight unfinished business Consideration of denying request for waiver or adjustment of below market rate housing requirements to Transit Village Project pursuant to Municipal Code Section 18.16.130. Someone going to be giving a report on this? Mr. Suve? No, Mr. Rubens. <clears throat> Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council, this is a follow up. Um, to an item on last uh, um, at your last agenda regarding the um, request by Legacy Partners LLC for a adjustment reduction or waiver of the below market rate housing requirements um, set forth in, in the municipal code. Um, the staff report um, identifies, um, attaches the last meeting agenda and uh, has a, um, a revised resolution as directed by the council. You might recall you tentatively denied the uh, waiver request at your last meeting and directed us to bring back a resolution incorporating um, the information both in the original staff report and as presented at the last meeting. So that's what you have before you tonight where the staff um, is recommending that you adopt the resolution denying the uh, request. Okay, questions for Mr. Rubens from the days? Okay, none right now, we might be later. Uh, would the developer like to speak? You don't have to. I'll, I'll, two minutes, I'll put you on the clock for that. <laughs> hi. hi, Jeff Bird with Legacy Partners. Uh, I just wanted to remind everyone there's been maybe some confusion out there. We've never sought to have a waiver of any requirement. Our core objective here is, as we've gone through this process over the last many years, We've been encouraged to figure out how to provide affordable housing, not just pay a fee. We desire to do that. We would like to work with the city to do that. We think that's a good public-private cooperation. The problem is the way the ordinance is structured, the box that it says do this or this, if you do the affordable housing, it is not possible. It's not financially possible. So we just like to, we, and we believe we can do this. We think we can work with staff and ultimately come back to the council with a proposal that allows us to provide uh, a, lar a large number of affordable housing units at levels that are, call it financially comparable to the fee, so that the city gets the most out of it. We do a good thing for the community and we don't just pay a fee and move along. Okay, great, thank you. Only a minute and five seconds, wow, that was good. Uh, I have one speaker card. I'm sorry, Mr. Seve. 
Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to add to that. Uh, since the last meeting, we received some financial data from Legacy Partners. Uh, as you will recall, there was a pro forma analysis that, that was done by the city. Actually, it was done by RSG, our economic consultant, and it had some information about uh, really the study was to uh, assess uh, if the project was significantly reduced, would it be financially feasible still as a project? And that's the reason the city undertook that pro forma. And I think it was added to the uh, BMR staff report at the last meeting for informational purposes. Since the last meeting, we've received some additional information from the developer. Uh, and city staff can look at that information uh, going forward and talk to the developer about it. But we haven't analyzed it. Okay. Just wanted to... Question, Mr. Albert? To that. Yes. Mr. Sebae, could you uh, uh, share with us when this additional information from Legacy Partners was provided to the staff? In the last week or so. Okay, so, it, and it, it was not, therefore, uh, factored into the staff report that no, we saw? No, it was not. So it was, it was late enough in the cycle that that, that yes. could not yeah. happen? Okay, yes. thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, is there anyone wishing, I have one speaker card. Uh, Person wishing to speak, Glenn Jolino. Good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Um, I would like to encourage you to uh, maintain uh, uh, the city's position on its current ordinance. Um, I've seen in the past with other issues that every time somebody lawyers up and threatens to sue the city, we seem to back off. Uh, we have force of law in an ordinance, and I, I think it's prudent to follow that. If it's an improper law, then it should be changed. But to give waivers or, or relax the rules just because somebody threatens to sue the city, I think is uh, inappropriate. Uh, otherwise, any time an issue comes along that somebody wants to do something that's not in compliance with an ordinance, all they got to do is threaten to sue the city. So based on that, those are my comments, and I'd like to see you hold them to it. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Jelleno, for your comments. Is there anyone else wishing to speak on this matter? Yes? Mr. Crabb? Can you fill out a card later for us, please, David? Thank you. I was, I was hoping I wouldn't have to speak tonight, but... Uh, uh, Honorable Mayor and Vice Mayor and members of the Council. Uh, very quickly, uh, we laid out our uh, argument uh, two weeks ago about why affordable housing is important. Uh, Sierra Club still backs affordable housing, so we would urge you to uh, you know, uh, vote against the waiver. Uh, you know, if, if Legacy has a problem with that thing, this project, I mean, why, why can't we look at uh, working with Sam Trans and Legacy and so on and making some of that property available to a nonprofit developer? So that uh, we, we reduce the uh, legacy chunk of it, give the rest of it to, to a nonprofit, and maybe one of those blocks, and that will solve your, your uh, low income pro uh, uh, market and it will give you a really serious low income rather than moderate that they claim is low income. But anyway, the bottom line is Sierra Club would like you to vote no to the waiver. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Yes, ma'am. And would you also fill out a card, please, after? Thank you. And just hand it to the city clerk after you speak. So I'm Vanessa Nevola, and um, I guess I'm confused, so I'm just here to ask questions. Um, the last council meeting, we were kind of leaning towards uh, denying the waiver, and now it sounds like maybe we're not leaning towards No, the towards requ that, request is or? to deny the waiver from staff. Okay. So, um, good. Um, Great. That's exactly what I would like. <laughs> um, although I don't think it really um, addresses the affordability issue. Um, I unfortunately didn't, I don't know if citizens are allowed to show things, um, and I didn't get this done in time, but maybe I can submit it. But I did a little analysis with a graph, and it sort of showed, um, you know, what Legacy was um, proposing and what the city ordinance said, and that if Legacy um, complies with the ordinance, probably what it will really look like um, in terms of um, affordability. And my guess is, or my sort of educated guess from the analysis is that there really won't be any affordable housing for um, median or moderate income people. It'll be the 42 units uh, for the low income and then it'll be high income. All the, the other 238 units will be high income. 
um, in order to make it financially viable for them. And, um, you know, I, f I find that problematic, um, that, you know, basically the sort of median level of income people, which are paramedics, police officers, firefighters, electricians, plumbers, teachers, librarians, um, are just kind of thrown out there to um, uh, just uncontrollable rents. And um, so anyway, um, that's my, my preference is that you at least vote uh, no to the waiver. And um, you can give is it, there a way have, to? Yeah, just give it to the city clerk, and she will process it and get it to all of us. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. <laughs> is there anyone else wishing to speak on this matter? OK. So council. Uh, Mr. Mayor, before uh, yes, I begin, sorry. I just had a, a factual clarification I'd like sure. to make sure was sure. Um, in the record. Uh, I understand that what was delivered to um, the city staff was a critique of the RSG study that you saw in the staff report, but it was not new um, financial um, information on the feasibility of the project. I wanted to make sure that was clear okay. in the record. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rubens. Yes, Mr. Olbert. Um, I, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I think, um, uh, despite what uh, Mr. Rubens just said, I think uh, we might want to think about continuing this item to our next meeting to have staff have an opportunity to finish their review of the uh, the critique of RSG's analysis. Um, I um, frankly am amazed at the incomplete nature of this application. I mean, our ordinance is a long-standing ordinance, and it's very clear about what you're supposed to provide. And we've been bending over backwards to. Uh, make sure that the record is as complete as possible and give people an opportunity to fulfill the obligations of the ordinance. But we also need to recognize, uh, although um, the gentleman is not here tonight, uh, we also heard a litany last time from Legacy's attorney that basically I interpreted as uh, you know them sharpening up their knives to explain how they were going to sue us. Um, and uh, given that, I don't feel under any compulsion tonight to act on this give staff time to look at it, and maybe they come back and say, oh, we haven't learned anything additional from, from Legacy's rebuttal, and then we can act on it. Um, okay. Thank you for your comments. Anyone else wishing to speak? I, I would just like to hear a response from staff to Mr. Olbert's questions. Well, um, I think I understand the question uh, Council Member Collins is, um, whether or not um, you could move forward with the resolution tonight based upon that information. And uh, I think I think you could. It's within your discretion to direct us to um, add to our resolution um, a response to whatever the critique was to the RSG study. Um, but um, I think that you could move forward with the uh, resolution as proposed tonight be based upon the fact that there was no new uh, feasibility um, information provided um, uh, with that uh, with that critique of the RSG study, but again, um, it's the council's discretion on that. But I, th I think you could, the way the staff reports um, worded and the way that re the current resolutions worded, uh, move forward tonight. Okay, thank you. Other comments, questions, with staff or I, I, or I most. I'm to, sorry. Go ahead. Sure. I just wanted to respond to that, Mr. Rubin. Uh, isn't it true though that this resolution is already? A revised resolution from what we had two weeks ago. Yes, we incorporated um, the the public comment um, at the last meeting, um, and um, made specific findings related to the project. Um, and it is an updated resolution from the or original. Okay. Thank you. Other comments, questions? With that I'll entertain a motion then. Mr. Mayor, I'll move that we approve resolution. Number 2013-94, a resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos denying Legacy Partners Residential LLC's request for a reduction, adjustment, or waiver of affordable housing requirements. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion? Mr. Olbert. Um, since uh, it appears that we're going to be moving forward with, with this denial, which I am fine with denying the request, um, I am going to vote in, in favor of uh, denying it, um, and hopefully we'll find out that the uh, there's nothing in the record that we would like to have put in. Any other comments? 
Yes, Mr. Grocott. I would just care to repeat um, what I said at the just quickly at the last council meeting that um, all of us know the board members of the Sam Trans board we go to different events with them, and I think if this even went to the Sam Trans board uh, as a you know some type of an advisory vote or something on including affordable housing on this site. They, it would probably be a unanimous vote in favor of it. So um, I think that's something to keep in mind. Okay. Other comments? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilmember Clapper? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Grisselli? Yes. Okay, thank you. Moving on, uh, new business. Uh, item 9A. Receive an update on implementation of commissioner orientation process and adopt a resolution to adopt to adopt the commissioner's handbook. Good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council. Crystal Moy, City uh, Clerk slash Director of Community Relations. At the last City Council meeting, um, the at the last City Council Strategic Plan Retreat in February of this year, uh, Council uh, developed an objective to develop and implement a commissioner orientation process. So I am before you tonight to uh, update you on that objective. In our past practices, after the closing of a filing period, the city clerk would coordinate uh, a time with the applicants for the interview with the council. Um, after the interviews, council usually appointed that evening, and a letter of congratulation was sent out from the clerk's office, along with uh, important document forms to fill out. From there, each department liaison was responsible for informing the commissioner on um, all important guidelines and uh, such as the Brown Act and public records law. So it's in order to ensure a more consistent and thorough process for all new commissioners, staff has developed a new commissioner orientation process. Um, as outlined there, and I'll go over a little bit more detail in the next slide. So the first step in the new orientation process is the meeting with staff. Uh, the staff City Manager and Department Liaison will meet with uh, all the applicants and the Chair of the Commission is invited to sit in as well. The purpose of this meeting is to provide candidates with some background information on the City as well as the Commission that they're applying for. The meeting will also be an opportunity for the applicants to ask questions of City staff and to gain a sense of what they can, to get a sense of what they can expect procedurally during the uh, interview with the Council. Should council request after this meeting, staff will be available to provide feedback on the applicants. The next step is the interview with the council. Um, commission chair will be invited to this interview to sit in, and um, staff will provide an extensive list to the council uh, with uh, questions that they would be able to select from. After uh, the council appoints a commissioner, the clerk's office will schedule an orientation with them um, where they'll be able to sit down with the city clerk, the city attorney, and staff liaison to review um, the Brown Act, conflict of interest, public records law, and uh, the city clerk will, uh, I will, um, work with them to set up an, a city email address and uh, administer the oath of office and also provide the um, code of conduct policy as well as the commissioner handbook. Key projects will be outlined by the uh, department liaison. And uh, the last step for the commissioner orientation process would be the welcome reception. This serves as an informal meet and greet for the, uh, for the commissioner and it is coordinated by the respective departments. So these two events provide the commission with uh, the commissioner with important information that's needed in their new role, but also kind of gives them a sense of belonging to, to their new commission. As part of the new orientation process, staff has prepared a commissioner handbook that is before you tonight for your consideration. 
It serves as a single source document that pulls together information from several existing documents. And it's designed as an easy to use reference for our commissioners, um, covering information from the structure of the city, uh, information on each of the commissions, commission memberships, uh, that outlines the, uh, the process that I just spoke about on the orientation and meeting with staff. Um, the operating procedures, so standard operating procedures in, in commission meetings, and also goes over in detail the imposed restraints. So this is the city's first generation commission handbook, and it's our hope that it will be continually updated and amended over time with council's uh, comments and suggestions. And that actually concludes my presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Um, so what we're calling the orientation process here applies to the application period as well as after the actual appointment to the commission. Am I, okay, I just wanted to make sure I wasn't making an assumption that I shouldn't mm -hmm. be. Thank you. Other, Mr. Olbert? No? Mr. Grocott? Mr. Collins? I'm sorry. Mr. Collins? Um, thank you, Crystal. Um, just curious. I, I, you may have gone over this, and maybe my mind was wandering, but who actually does the orientation would that be you the city, in on it uh, the city I will be there as long as well as the city attorney and staff liaison for that okay. commissioner that commission right. okay and as a former member of the Planning Commission and EDAC I can tell you that I I welcome these changes because when I was on EDAC I didn't know I was subject to the Brown Act oh and the the Commission chair is also invited to sit in on that as well okay, okay. great thank you Mr. Brokaw, any questions Mr. Albert okay all right, thank you. So um, this item is before us. Do I hear a motion? Or excuse me, anyone wishing to speak on this item? I should make sure that anyone wishing to speak from the public? Okay, hearing none, entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll uh, move we approve resolution 2013-95. 95, resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos adopting the City of San Carlos Commissioner's Handbook. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion on this matter? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilmember Clapper? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Grisilli? Yes. Thank you. Next item on our agenda is item 9B, consideration of adopting updated salary and benefits resolution for the management group. <coughs> Mr. Maltby? Good evening, Honorable Mayor, members of the City Council, Jeff Maltby, City Manager. This item before you this evening is a salary and benefit resolution for the uh, management employees of the city. The previous salary and benefit resolution expired July 1st of this year and was in place for one year uh, prior. The summary of changes included in this uh, proposed two-year salary uh, and benefit resolution are a two-year term, which would end June 30th, 2015, a salary adjustment of 3% July 1st, 2013, and 3% July 1st, 2014. The Section 125 Flex Plan benefit, which in layman's terms is the medical benefit offered to employees. <laughs> Uh, employees will pay the first 2% of any increase in the health premium. So in other words, if uh, Kaiser uh, raises their rates uh, 7%, the employees would pay the first 2% of that increase, and the uh, city would pay the remaining 5 The uh, current standard that's been in place in the uh, existing salary and benefit resolution were that the employees would pay the first 5%. There's also a provision in this agreement that would... Um, uh, take place uh, if a management employee were fired a severance package in exchange for all the employees in the uh, salary uh, in the uh, management unit rather uh, becoming at will employees so they'll be operating under at will employment for the entire uh, collection of employees the uh, cost of these on an annual basis is approximately one hundred thousand dollars in terms of the increase, that covers all the economic elements in the salary and benefit increase over what is 
uh, currently in place now. Uh, this gives you some indication of the general fund revenues the last few years. Uh, we've seen approximately 9% growth over the last five years with significant growth coming in the last uh, 12 to 18 months. And I'm showing you this slide because I think it's important to put into context for the council uh, as well as the public uh, why we're uh, recommending these increases. Going back uh, approximately four or five years ago when the city was in uh, uh, deep financial uh, distress, as many cities were uh, as we entered the Great Recession, the employees were asked to contribute, uh, in many instances, 5% uh, of their total compensation package, so a number greater than their salary component of that package. Uh, the management employees contributed 8% of their total compensation was uh, uh, given back to help the city balance its budget uh, during those tough times. I think part of that uh, bargain and part of the reason that I'm recommending this increase for you tonight is because uh, when we ask our employees uh, a number of years ago for their help and assistance, uh, they gave it because they believe in the organization, they believe in the community, and they believe that they have uh, a responsibility to help balance the books as well as the, as well as the council as a significant portion of our ongoing uh, annual operating expenses. When revenues are up, uh, it's time to go the other way and, and begin to keep pace with inflation and offer the employees a fair compensation package. What we did a number of years ago uh, and what continues to be in place today are some pretty significant changes in the benefit package uh, which is offered our employees. Uh, we reduced that package in many, many ways, more ways than, than uh, I'm going to go into uh, tonight. Those uh, changes remain in place uh, this evening and uh, uh, should, in my opinion, remain in place uh, for the foreseeable future. This will give you some indication of the uh, miscellaneous salaries and benefits and what this uh, picture looks like for the city over the same number of years of the revenue I just uh, shown you. This does include, obviously, changes in how we staff and provide services within the organization including uh, contracting for uh, a shared service arrangement with Redwood City for fire, as well as a shared service relationship with uh, the San Mateo County Sheriff's Office for police. Uh, with that in mind, I'm recommending what is before you with one change for you to consider, and that is uh, Section 17, which uh, contains language about provisions that would take place if other units of the city were granted uh, in increases, often referred to as Me Too language. And I am uh, requesting for your consideration that you strike Section 17 from the attached salary and benefit resolution if you are so inclined to make a motion for consideration of approval this evening. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Malpe. Questions for Mr. Malpe? Ms. Clapper? I just want to make sure I'm clear on the, the scale on these charts, the numbers that are on the left-hand side of this slide as well as the previous slide. Are in millions. In millions. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Albert? Yes, uh, Mr. Malpe, just a, um, one first quick question. Uh, the $100,000 that you were talking about, the all-in cost, um, can you refresh my memory? Is that per year or is that for the two-year contract? That is per year. So it's 100000 the first year and 100000 roughly on top of it the, the next year? Well, yes. Okay. Um, and then uh, uh, this, this will put you on the spot a little bit, but uh, my, my review of the city's financial situation makes me believe that this is a reasonable thing to consider doing. I'd just like to get your sense of whether you think it's – you're obviously recommending it. You're reasonably comfortable with it, or are you a little nervous about it? Or um, I, I would say um, I'm very comfortable with it. I think in, in terms of uh, timing, this is coming at the right time for the city. And again, you know, if there are any employees of the organization that are listening, that's no guarantee that you know, some years from now we may be back in front of them asking for – uh, assistance in balancing the budget because the economy's taken a downturn or the state has diverted money from the city or any number of reasons that are beyond the control of any of us in the room. In fact, I think given a, a long-term view uh, of terms of finances and the city should have a very long-term view, that's likely to happen one day. But right now in, in terms of the next two-year cycle, 
um, I think this is a very reasonable approach to the compensation package, particularly given the fact that it still contains within it many provisions, many, many provisions of the benefit rejections that were put in place a number of years ago. Thank you. Um, just one other brief brief comment. Um, uh, it's for the members, benefit of the members of the public. Uh, we obviously, as part of closed session negotiations, have a lot of discussions about things. So to some extent, when you do see a dearth of questions from the dais, it doesn't necessarily reflect a lack of interest. It reflects the fact that we've talked about this stuff at great length. And I, I can testify that uh, all five of the council members had many, many questions throughout this process. <coughs> Other questions for staff? Uh, Mr. Collins? I have one. Uh, Mr. Malpe, I'm just curious, uh, in this management group, uh, how many employees that took this, uh, took the 8% uh, compensation reduction in whenever it was, 20, or 2009, 2010, are still here? You know, I, I couldn't answer that question. I have, I have not looked at it that way myself. Um, a fair number, uh, okay. more than half, but beyond that, I couldn't. I couldn't answer specifically. Okay, thank you. Other questions? Hearing none, thank you, Mr. Malpe. Thank you. Is there anyone from the public wishing to speak on this item? Please step up, and then we have, a, Chris, you already have that name, just add a card for it. Just for clarification purposes uh, regarding uh, possible adoption of this resolution, what is the number of employees affected? I think it's if, 20, Mr. Malpe? Uh, it's 17 employees with the possibility for 19. Okay. And the second question would be, are they all full-time, or is there a differentiation between part-time, full-time? Mr. Malpe, they're all full-time? These are all full-time employees. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the public? Okay. Seeing none, Council, what's your preference on this item? And we'll have discussion after the motion if we need some. Do you want a motion? Please, if you could, that would be good. Okay. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I'll, I'll uh, recommend that, or uh, move that we approve Resolution 2013-96. Correct. Resolution of the City Council of San Carlos adopting the salary and benefit resolution between the City of San Carlos and the management unit. And excluding item 17? And excluding item 17. Okay, just Anything thought else it. we need to? Right. Is that okay? Second. Thank you. Okay, moved and seconded. Discussion? Comments? Mr. Grocott? Well, I made most of my comments in closed session. I'm giving you an so, opportunity yeah, to do it in public. Yeah, um, I'm going to vote no. I think it's a, a bit generous, I, I, the uh, increase. Um, I always keep in mind, for one thing, too, that we do have steps in addition to these types of raises there's uh, <coughs> each employee is in a step program so uh, if you're at the bottom during your years of service you can move up to the top and you get a, an increase that way um, and then I, I think the biggest thing though is two items one you know we we keep looking at things where uh, we have cost increases and we pass those on through rates and fees to our citizens um, and I would love to be able to have some money to mitigate some of those items with. I've talked about that in the past. Um, and then the other item is that uh, while we appear to be very strong financially, I think one of the, the big unanswered questions we have, and it's, it's not entirely our own fault, but it's because of our situation with CalPERS, um, is our unfunded liabilities and exactly where we stand with those liabilities. And, uh, trying to pay those down, should we be set setting money aside uh, and keeping a reserve fund for that? Um, I, I think that if, if we could include those numbers, it would give us a more true picture of our financial status. And then uh, thirdly, I said there would be two, but I thought of another one that I was had mentioned before, and that is just on our capital improvement program, uh, there was a time where we used to take all of our uh, franchise fee money and put it towards capital improvements. Could we, could we speak to this, this item, though, Mr. Brokaw? Well, it, to... it does speak okay. to this Go item ahead. because uh, what I'm saying is that, you know, this is just a group of 17 employees. We have a lot more to go from here, and this is just $100,000 and an increase per year. If you look at it all, 
you know, I'm weighing, in other words, I'm weighing our operations costs against what our, our capital improvement costs, and that's an area where we've been remiss over the years for different reasons, partly because of the economy. And uh, so that's, okay. that's what I'm weighing. Um, you and I sometimes, you know, have philosophical differences. Sometimes we don't. This time we do. I think, as Mr. Malby said, we have a good group of people that work here, and they made a, a large concession a number of years ago as a team playing type situation. Uh, people need to be paid a fair wage, and I believe this is certainly within the parameters of a fair wage. It's not overly high, in my opinion, and it's a two-year contract, which is also locking in our costs, and we'll know what our costs are going to be. So uh, I think this is money well spent, and I believe that uh, it's a good thing to pass. So we'll do the roll call. Roll call, please. You are entertaining any more discussion? I assumed we were all done because no one wanted to say anything. Oh. No. I looked around and I even I approached Mr. Grokot. I apologize. I, apologize. I, I just I, assumed I, you were starting. No, I wasn't starting. If I looked, I heard nothing. Down. I looked at him. Please. Okay. <laughs> um, I I will be voting for this. Um, however, I, I I do think that in the future we may need to be looking um, at not having these kinds of increases. But I think at this point in time we do have an excellent staff. We have a um, great leadership team. And um, given where right now the uh, cost of living increases are going, this seems very reasonable. Um, and I think we have the options for being able to adjust salaries in the future. This isn't giving any additional money and benefits that would be uh, difficult to recoup. It's really tough to look at each, each dollar that we, uh, that we have available and decide how, how we're going to tear it into pieces and, and, and use it and to say what we're going to use to pay our staff and what we're going to use to provide benefits to the people who live and work in our community. It's a, a tough decision, but I think at this point in time, this is a, a very good direction to go in. Mr. Collins? Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm going to be voting in favor of this, and primarily the reasons for me is that employer-employee relations are really a, a two-way street. And for me, this comes down to, to it being a matter of loyalty. Um, Mr. Malpe couldn't remember, but it was at least half, he said, that uh, are still here. So those people, out of loyalty to the city, because they like working here, uh, took an 8% cut four years ago. Our revenues are up $2 million since that time, if I understand this, the uh, general fund revenue bar chart here. Um, our finances are better. We have a well-managed budget. Um, and our employees were... Uh, loyal at a at a time when um, when it was uh, when we were in really a, a very difficult position financially, and we were uh, we were making a lot of huge changes to outsourcing police department, a fire department, those sort of things. To me, and, and on top of all that, this is a three percent increase, three percent next year. It's really a partial restoration. If you cut somebody's pay ten percent this year, and then you say to them, "I'll I'll." but I'll increase your pay 10% next year. That's not a salary recovery. That's a partial recovery because you have to raise their pay maybe 11 or 12% to get back to where they were. Um, so, and Mr. Grokot mentioned that we, you know, we need to allocate uh, money to other purposes. Well, those things are already in the budget. The money's already been allocated. We've looked at and planned for and budgeted for contributions to capital improvement, uh, pension contributions and that sort of thing. So, as I say, this to me is uh, it's really a question of loyalty, and I think it's time that we we return the favor of loyalty to those employees that have served us well for the last several years. Mr. Olbert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I won't reiterate the same sentiments that I've heard Ms. Clapper and and uh, Mr. Collins say. I, I did want to just mention one thing. Um, uh, in response to something Mr. Grokot said, I actually think it would be uh, useful for us to agendize, we had one about a year ago, useful for us to agendize a discussion of unfunded pension liabilities, again, briefly. Um, I'm sure we've all been thinking about that um, because it's a big issue throughout California. I know I have, and there's some things I think that we ought to talk about um, because it's you know not beyond the realm of possibility. If we wanted to put money aside, we could do that. I like to actually talk about that before we actually did it. but um, So I would encourage us to have that discussion at some point. Mr. Walpe, you know, we have a report coming out in October. Ms. Mendenhall, I think, you told me in October or so we're going to get some report 
from uh, on on more more solid numbers on that. Okay, I would say then when we get that report, it would be presented to us at council, and we can have a discussion on it. We'll agendize it at that time. Okay. Good. All right. Roll call, please. Councilmember Copper. Yes. Councilmember Collins. Yes. Councilmember Grocott. No. Councilmember Olbert. Yes. Mayor Grisilli. Yes. Okay. We have two items to go back to on the uh, <clears throat> consent calendar. Item 7C, authorizing the mayor to sign a letter in response to the civil grand jury report, San Mateo County Special Districts, who was really in charge of the taxpayers' money. The Mosquito District embezzlement is the tip of the iceberg. That's uh, not our words, but the uh, grand jury's words. Mr. Grocott, you pulled that? I did. Um, there were two things I wanted to bring up on that. Um, mm -hmm. The first one, I'm looking at the letter yeah. itself. And... Um, over there so uh, looking at the letter the draft of the letter and under item six it says trustee and senior district staff should receive monthly financial reports um, I know one of the things that we receive as a council and can be very helpful I know I've used them before uh, to sort of root out things is the warrants and I don't know if they get those. Um, if not, it seems like that would be something to add to the letter that they should get, uh, the trustees should get uh, monthly financial reports and the warrants. Warrants being essentially canceled checks. Mm -hmm. um, we're, we're just responding to, well, we can, I guess we could add that, agree with this finding, and, and, and we could say, and we encourage that uh, warrants are also uh, uh, provided. Any, yeah. dis any problem with that, Council? Okay, staff. Okay, fine. That's a good idea. Anything else? Uh, then just the other item is item 11. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't really know how to approach this, and I didn't talk to anybody in advance, but item 11 talks about uh, LAFCO rejected the recommendation, uh, even though LAFCO Commission rejected the recommendation to dissolve the district and transfer its functions uh, to the county, this issue needs further evaluation, and then the city's response is that we agree with that, and it mm -hmm. then cites how the council in February of uh, 2012 was in support of the recommendation to dissolve the district. I know at the time, and I still am, I was opposed to that because I think one of the reasons that the embezzlement even got discovered is because it is a rather small organization, and somebody like Betsy could. Uh, do her job and recognize what was going on, whereas if it were part of the county and a larger organization, uh, while they may have more checks and balances to things at the same time, being such a large organization, sometimes it's easier to uh, do these kinds of things and get away with it for a time. So I don't know where this council stands on that issue, but I would be curious because we may want to adjust the letter depending on how. Th this is a far different council. At the time, it was Mr. Royce, uh, Mr. Klein, uh, Mr. Grisilli, myself, and I forget who the fifth person was at the time. But uh, no, it's, it's, it's Mr. Grocott, Mr. Royce. I, when, I when, we f when we first did this, uh, when this first came up, was it? So you were, you were on the council, too. So, But there are two new council members. and. Well, I'm, I'm, if, if uh, anyone wants to change this, the, the response is the city agrees with this finding, which would mean a majority of the council agrees with it. Is there uh, uh, any change on, on, on this or any uh, comment? Otherwise, we just go with this writing, if, unless there's two other votes with Mr. Grocott. I haven't changed my mind. Well, I haven't changed my mind, so anyone else? Nope. Okay, so I think we'll leave it the way it is on that one. Okay. Um, so if that's it, I will ask for a motion. Mr. Motion on Mr. 7C. Mayor, can I just... Suggest a grammatical correction. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. I didn't realize there were other. <laughs> uh, yeah. In the findings, I think this is, uh, yeah, this is our response in the mayor's letter. Mm -hmm. In the findings, it says, uh, no, finding number one response, the city partially disagrees with this finding. Where, I'm sorry. Where are you? Number one. On the number, number one. one. Oh, okay. Got it. Got it. I'm sorry. Okay. Gotcha. Letter. Gotcha. At least my copy doesn't show an, uh, a close quote or an end quote. It starts with, quote only one trustee but then I don't uh, does the end quote meant to be at the end of that paragraph or at the end of the sentence before the end of the paragraph I'm not really sure Mr. Collins you must have been a former English teacher <laughs> okay so well, staff whatever teacher. whatever wherever it is just fix it just fix it yeah. that's it okay anything else 
All right. So let's have a um, roll call, please. If we have a motion and a second? We have a motion. I apologize. Motion and second. I, I would move that we uh, authorize the mayor to sign this letter and ship it off to uh, who are we shipping it to? The grand jury. The, uh, the grand jury. The grand jury. The grand jury. Second. Okay. With the adjustments that we discussed, a couple of quick adjustments. Exactly. Thank All you. right. Is there, I'm sorry. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Hearing none, uh, roll call, please. Councilmember Clapper? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Gokot? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Grisilli? Yes. Okay. Next item is 7F, adopt a resolution appropriating $88,677 from the general fund reserves for the Highlands Field artificial turf infield replacement and authorize the sole source purchase from Le Monta Sport USA. Or Le Monta. Mr. Gokot. So the reason I pulled this is I was just curious. Um, seems like we're paying for, as it explains here, the different reasons for replacing some of the turf. Um, and yet it seems, when I read this one part that says, uh, staff had has experienced difficulty with the final field construction as the method used to secure the artificial turf seams, uh, the se in other words, the seams in the turf, has failed in the majority of locations and that somehow interrupted our ability to maintain the field as is recommended by the manufacturer to stay under warranty. What I'm seeing here is we're paying for, uh, you know, if, if, if the turf was installed per the manufacturer's recommendations and specifications, then the problem would fall either on the manufacturer or the contractor who installed it, and yet we're the ones paying for it. And this to me is like the, the bolts on the Bay Bridge. Why should we pay for it? We didn't screw Good it up. So um, Good question. I, you know, I think it should be covered some other way. Mr. Walter, you are luckily get to answer this, so go ahead. I'll, I'll give it my best. Mr. Mayor, members of council, Jay Walter, Public Works Director. Um, <clears throat> first off, this item in particular is one which, because the city has been collecting money into the fund from the various sports teams, we needed to have an, uh, an ability to be able to, to get at some of that money if indeed we have to pay the full freight for this. We're in the process of trying to negotiate with the, the manufacturer for a reduced price. Um, we hope that it would be one that we wouldn't have to pay any labor for installation of this, but at least in part, because we've had the use of the fields for the first couple of years since they've been in, the infill itself has begun to deteriorate. That's something that will occur over time. So there is, a, there is an amount of infill you would expect to have to replace over a period of time. This, we kind of think this is excessive, and at least in part it's been because the field itself hasn't, um, uh, hasn't done what it was supposed to do as far as the seams and things like that. The manufacturer has been out to fix all those seams at no cost to the city. So at this point, um, we're, we're trying to, to be in a position where we can get the infill here, get it deposited in the field, get it groomed out so that our field is in, remains in really good shape. Mm -hmm. um, and again, trying to negotiate with them for a lower price. But I simply needed to get an appropriation item to the council so that I would be able to purchase the infill at whatever price we negotiate. And, and I had, so I can appreciate that. So what you're saying is we're gonna go ahead and get the material, use it and so forth, but in the meantime, and we're gonna to have to pay for it, but in the meantime, we're gonna to have to, we're trying to negotiate to get that price lowered. That's correct. Okay, and then uh, being that we're having to do this, um, how are we on target for the idea of the money, as you mentioned, that the sports teams pay, is so that when it comes time to replace this field, we have at least in part money to replace the field, correct? So how, are, how, how does this put us on that target? Well, as, as I mentioned in the staff report, we had uh, approximately $255,000 in the fund. And uh, so I would say that's a long way from ultimately being able to replace the turf itself. Um, I don't know what our uh, yearly contributions are to this fund, uh, but I know that we're, we would be looking at the full nine-year period before we would have to go back and really look to try to replace the field. Mm -hmm. But we are actively re recovering costs from those teams as they register to play on the fields. I can add just a little bit of information to that. If memory serves, um, when the field was adopted, 
uh, it was under the assumption of a nine to 12 year lifespan, depending yeah. on, on use and wear and tear and that kind of thing. And also memory serves that we were talking about raising a million dollars or more through the I fee see. for, right. for the field. So we're tracking pretty close to that. Um, this puts a little, you know, uses a little bit of that, that money, obviously. Um, but I think I think otherwise we're tracking very close to where we thought we would be three years ago when the council adopted the policies that are in place right now. Mr. Albert, yes, uh, Mr. Malpe, since you and I had talked about this offline, um, my recollection is that uh, staff is um, not only negotiating to try and get a better price on the replacement infill material, but also considering whether or not there may be other avenues for recouping some of the cost as well, but that those are limited, potentially limited by the nature of the contract that was signed. That's correct. We're looking at all possibilities. And in fact, one that um, I had a conversation before the meeting with Mr. Walter, and he reminded me of that I had forgot to mention when you and I talked. We're also looking at um, another <coughs> vendor. Another what? Uh, another vendor as a possibility, uh, not only to reduce costs, but help increase the city's leverage in terms of negotiating with the vendor we've got. Okay, thank you, Mr. Walter, very much. Um, so do I hear a motion on this item? Mr. Mayor, I will move that the council adopt resolution number 2013-97. 91. 91, oh, you're right, it's out of, I, we took it out of order. 91, 2013-91. Resolution of the City Council of the City of San Carlos appropriating $88,677 from general fund reserves and authorizing the sole source purchase of organic infill material for Highlands Field from Lamanta Sport USA. Is there a second? Second. Moved and seconded to adopt this resolution. Any further discussion? Hearing none, roll call, please. Councilmember Clapper? Yes. Councilmember Collins? Yes. Councilmember Grocott? Yes. Councilmember Obert? Yes. Mayor Grisselli? Yes. And looking at the agenda, I believe we have uh, gone through it. So, ladies and gentlemen, I would say we're moving now into a closed session, and uh, we'll be coming back to uh, report on that if there is any reportable items or not. Well, we'll, we'll be meeting in the West Gallery, and there'll be uh, if there's any report out, it'll occur at the West Gallery at the conclusion okay. of that meeting. We will do that. Otherwise, we're done.